Chapter 3 Painting in Italy from the beginning of the Renaissance to the present century Part 4 It is impossible here to follow step by step the life and works of this master. Among the other great things which he did are the tomb of Julius II in the church of St. Pietro in Vincoli in Rome of which the famous statue of Moses makes a part. He made the statues in the Medici Chapel in the church of San Lorenzo. In Florence, the painting of the Last Judgment on a wall of the Sistine Chapel and many works as an architect. For he was called upon to attend to fortifications both in Florence and Rome. And at last, as his greatest work of this sort, he was the architect of St. Peter's at Rome. Many different artists had a share in this work, but as it now is Michelangelo may be counted as its real architect. His works are numerous and only a small part of them is here mentioned. But I have spoken of those by which he is most remembered. His life, too, was a stormy one for many reasons that we have not space to tell. While he lived, there were wars and great changes in Italy. He served also under nine popes, and during his life, thirteen men occupied the papal chair. Besides, being a great as a painter, an architect, and a sculptor, he was a poet, and wrote sonnets well worthy of such a genius as his. His whole life was so serious and sad that it gives one joy to know that in his old age he formed an intimate friendship with Vittoria Colonna, a wonderful woman who made a sweet return to him for all the tender devotion which he lavished upon her. Italians associate the name of Michelangelo with those of the divine poet Dante and the painter Raphael, and these three are spoken of as the three greatest men of their country. In what are called the modern days, Michelangelo died at Rome in 1564, when 89 years old. He desired to be buried in Florence, but his friends feared to let this be known lest the Pope should forbid his removal. He was therefore buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles, but his nephew Leonardo Bonarotti conveyed his remains to Florence secretly, disguised as a bale of merchandise. At Florence, on a Sunday night, his body was borne to Santa Cruz in a torchlight procession and followed by many thousands of citizens. There, his friends once more gazed upon the face which he had not been seen in Florence for 30 years. He looked as if quietly sleeping. Some days later, a splendid memorial service was held in San Lorenzo, attended by all the court, the artists, scholars, and eminent men of the city. An oration was pronounced. Rare statues and paintings were collected in the church. All the shops of the city were closed, and the squares were filled with people. Above his grave in Santa Cruz, where he lies near Dante, Machiavelli, Galileo, and many other great men, the Duke and Leonardo Bunarotti erected a monument. It has statues of painting, sculpture, and architecture, and a bust of the great man 
who sleeps beneath. In the court of the Uffizi, his statue stands together with those of other great Florentines. His house in the Gilbelin Street now belongs to the city of Florence and contains many treasured mementos of his life and works. It is open to all who wants to visit it. In 1875, a grand festival was held in Florence to celebrate the 400th anniversary of his birth. The ceremonies were very impressive and at the same time some documents which related to his life and had never been opened were by command of Victor Emmanuel given to proper persons to be examined. Thus, it is the great deeds of great men lived on and on, through all the time, and it is a joy to know that though the four score and nine years of the life of the artist had much of care and sorrow in them, his name and memory are still cherished and must continue to be, while from his life many lessons may be drawn to benefit and encourage others. Lessons which we cannot hear right out, but they teach patience, industry, and faithfulness to duty while they also warn us to avoid the bitterness and roughness which are blemishes on the memory of this great good man. Daniel de Volterra was the best scholar of Michelangelo. His principal pictures are the descent from the cross in the church of Trinita di Monti in Rome and the massacre of the innocents in the Opizi Gallery. Both are celebrated works. The next important Florentine painter was Andrea del Sarto. His family name was Vanucci, but because his father was a tailor, the Italian term for one of his trade, un sarto, came to be used for the son. Early in life, Andrea was a goldsmith, as were so many artists, but when he was able to study painting under Pietro di Cosimo, he became devoted to it and soon developed his own style, which was very soft and pleasing. His pictures cannot be called great works of art, but they are favorites with a large number of people. He succeeded in fresco painting and decorated several buildings in Florence, among them the Scalzo, which was a place where the barefooted friars held their meetings and was named from them, as they are called Scalzi. These frescoes are now much injured, but they are thought his best works of his kind. Probably Andrea del Sarto would have come to be a better painter if he had been a happier man. His wife, of whom he was very fond, was a mean, selfish woman who wished only to make a great show and did not value her husband's talents except for the money which they brought him. She even influenced him to desert his parents to whom he had ever been a dutiful son. About 1518, Francis I, King of France, invited Andrea to Paris to execute some works for him. The painter went and was well established there and very popular when his wife insisted that he should return to Florence. Francis I was very unwilling to spare him, but Andrea dared not refuse to go to his wife, so he solemnly took an oath to return to Paris and bring his wife, so that he could remain as long as pleased the king and then that sovereign consented. 
Francis also gave the artist a large sum of money to buy for him all sorts of beautiful objects. When Andrea reached Florence, his wife refused to go to France and persuaded him to give her the king's journey. She soon spent it and Andrea, who lived 10 years more, was very unhappy while the king never forgave him. And to this day, this wretched story must be told and continues the remembrance of his dishonesty. After all, he had sacrificed for his wife when he became very ill in 1530 of some contagious disease. She deserted him. He died alone and with no prayer or funeral was buried in the convent of Nunziata where he had painted some of his frescoes. His pictures are very numerous. They are correct in drawing, very softly finished, and have a peculiar gray tone of color. He painted a great number of holy families, one of which is called the Madonna del Sacco, because Saint Joseph is learning on a sack. This is in the convent where he buried. His best work is called the Madonna di San Francesco and hangs in the tribune of the Uffizi Gallery. This is a most honorable place, for near it are pictures by Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, and other great painters, as well as some very celebrated statues, such as the Venus de Medici and the Dancing Faun. Andrea del Sarto's picture of the Madonna and Child are almost numberless. They are sweet, attractive works are also his Saint Barbara, Saint Agnes, and others of his single figures. We will now leave the Florentine school of the 16th century and speak of the great master of the Roman school, Raphael Sanzio or Santi who was born at Urbino on Good Friday. His father was a painter, and Raphael showed his taste for art very early in life. Both his parents died, where he was still a child. And though he must have learned something from seeing his father and other painters at their work. We say that Perugino was his first master. For he was but 12 years old when he entered the studio of that painter in Perugia. Here, he remained more than 8 years, and about the time of living, painted the very celebrated picture called Lo Sposalizio, or The Marriage of the Virgin, now in the Brera at Milan. This picture is famous the world over and is very important in the life of the painter because it shows the highest point he reached under Perugino or during what is called his first manner in painting. Before this, he had executed a large number of beautiful pictures among which was the so-called Staffa Madonna. This is a circular picture and represents the Virgin walking in a springtime landscape. It remained in the Staffa Palace in the Perugia 368 years and in 1871 was sold to the Emperor of Russia for $70,000. In 1504, Raphael returned to Urbino where he became the favorite of the court and was much employed by the Ducal family. To this time belong the St. George slay Angie the Dragon and the St. Michael attacking Satan, now in the gallery of the Louvre. But the young artist soon grew weary of the narrowness of his life and went to Florence 
were amid the treasures of art with which that city was crowded. He felt as he was in an enchanted land. It is worthwhile to recount the wonderful things he saw. They were the cathedral with the dome of Brunelleschi, the tower of Giotto, the marbles and bronze of Donatello, the baptistery gates of Ghiberti, the pictures of Masaccio, Gerlandajo, Fra Angelico, and many other older masters, while Michelangelo and Leonardo were surprising themselves and all others with their beautiful works. At this time, the second manner of Raphael began. During his first winter, here he painted the so-called Madonna della Gran Duca, now in the Pitti Gallery and thus named because the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Ferdinand III, carried it with him on all his journeys and said his prayers before it at morning and evening. He made a visit to Urbino in 1505 and wherever he was, he worked continually and finished a great number of pictures which as yet were of religious subjects with few and unimportant exceptions. When he returned to Florence in 1506, the cartoon of Leonardo da Vinci's Battle the Standard and Michelangelo's Bathing Soldiers revealed a new world of art to Raphael. He saw that heroic, exciting scenes could be represented by painting and that vigor and passion could speak from the canvas as powerful as Christian love and resignation. Still, he did not attempt any new thing immediately. In Florence, he moved in the best circles. He received orders for some portraits of nobles and wealthy men, as well as for Madonnas and holy families. Before long, he visited Bologna and went again to Urbino, which had become a very important city under the reign of Duke Guidobaldo. The King of England, Henry VIII, had sent to this Duke the decoration of the Order of the Garter. In return for this honor, the Duke sent the King rich gifts, among which was a picture of St. George and the Dragon of Raphael. While at Urbino at this time, he painted his first classic subject, the Three Graces. Soon after, he returned the third time to Florence and now held much intercourse with Fra Bartolomeo, who gave the younger artist valuable instruction as to his color and drapery. In 1508, among a great number of pictures, he painted the Madonna which is called La Belle Hardiniere and is now one of the treasures of the Louvre. The Virgin is pictured in the midst of a flowery landscape and it has been said that a beautiful flower girl to whom Raphael was attached was his model for the picture. This picture is also a landmark in the history of Raphael, for it shows the perfection of his second manner, and the change that had come over him from his Florentine experience and associations. His earlier pictures had been full of a sweet, unearthly feeling, and a color which could be called spiritual was spread over them. Now. His Madonnas were like beautiful earthly mothers, his colors were deep and rich, and his landscapes were often replaced by architectural backgrounds which gave a stately air where all before had been simplicity. His skill in grouping, in color, and in drapery was now marvelous, and when in 1508 the Pope who had seen, seen some of his works, summoned him to him Rome. 
he went fully prepared for the great future, which was before him and now began his third or Roman manner of painting. This pope was Julius II, who held a magnificent court and was ambitious for glory in every department of life, as a temporal as well as spiritual ruler, and as a patron of art and letters as well as in his office of the protector of the Holy Church. He had vast designs for the adornment of Rome and immediately employed Raphael in the decoration of the first of the stanze, or halls of the Vatican, four of which he ornamented with magnificent frescoes before his death. He also executed wall paintings in the Chigi Palace and in the chapel of the Church of Santa Maria de la Paz. With the exception of a short visit to Florence, Raphael passed the remainder of his life in Rome. The amount of work which he did as an architect, sculptor, and painter was marvelous and would require the space of a volume to follow it and name all his achievements step by step. So. I shall only tell you some of his best known works and those which are most often mentioned. While he was working upon the halls of the Vatican, Julius II died. He was succeeded by Leo X, who also was a generous patron to Raphael, who thus suffered no loss of occupation from the change of popes. The artist became very popular and rich. He had many pupils and was assisted by them in his great frescoes not only in the Vatican but also in the Farsina Villa or Chigi Palace. Raphael had the power to attach men to him with devoted affection and his pupils gave him personal service gladly. He was often seen in the street with numbers of them in attendance, just as the nobles were followed by their squires and pages. He built himself a house in the quarter of the city called the Borgo. Not far from the church of St. Peter's and during the remainder of his life was attended by prosperity and success. One of the important works which he did for Leo X was the making of cartoons or designs to be executed in tapestry for the decoration of the Sistine Chapel, where Michelangelo had painted his great frescoes. The Pope ordered these tapestries to be woven in the looms of Flanders, from the richest materials and a quantity of gold thread was used in them. They were completed and sent to Rome in 1519 and were exhibited to the people the day after Christmas when all the city flocked to see them. In 1527, when the constable de Bourbon allowed the French soldiers to sack Rome these tapestries were carried away. In 1553, they were restored but one was missing, and it is believed that it had been destroyed for the sake of the gold thread which was in it. Again, in 1798, the French carried them away and sold them to a Jew in Leghorn, who burned one of the pieces but his gain in gold was so little that he preserved the others. And Pius VII bought them and restored them to the Vatican. The cartoons, however, are far more important than the tapestries because they are the work of Raphael himself. The weavers at Arras tossed them aside after using them, and some were thorn, but a century later, the artist Rubens learned 
that they existed and advised King Charles I of England to buy them. This he did, and thus the cartoons met with as many ups and downs as the tapestries had. When they reached England, they were in strips. The workmen had cut them for their convenience. After the king was executed, Cromwell bought the cartoons for 300 pounds. When Charles II was king and in great need of money, he was sorely tempted to sell them to Louis XIV, who coveted them and wished to add them to the treasures of France. But Lord Danby persuaded Charles to keep them. In 1698, they were barely saved from fire at Whitehall. And finally, by command of William III, they were properly repaired and a room was built at Hampton Court to receive them. By the architect Sir Christopher Wren. At present, they are in the South Kensington Museum, London. Of the original 11, only 7 remain.